Welcome back, Joystick Justice League, to episode three of JJL Live. I'm your host, Mike Frisios, and this is my new one-hour weekly industry-wide news roundup podcast with, of course, the recurring segment, The Greek Speaks, at the very end where I actually spend about 15 minutes going a little bit more in depth into a particular topic or issue facing gaming and the industry as a whole. And uh, this week's should be no different. Quite a doozy I've got ready for you at the end of this podcast. But in the meantime, let's do the usual. Let's go through all the various sectors of the industry, starting with third-party news, then moving into Nintendo and Sony and Microsoft, respectively. Starting off with third-party news. Now, as I keep saying every week, you know, I'm trying to figure out the timing of the show, the format, when to get it out. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep it on a regular schedule, but you know, like I said, I, I work shift work. It, it depends. I also have a life too, so I have to make the show fit into my life. And I'm kind of glad that the show got delayed again a little bit this week. That I'm sitting here recording this today on Tuesday because if I had recorded this yesterday, I might not get to talk about a major news bombshell in the PC arena that dropped this morning when I got out of bed and wow some exciting stuff for not only PC gamers but broadcasters alike especially myself being a game broadcaster on Twitch TV um, I just found that this to be incredibly exciting news something I've been waiting to hear for a while I knew it was coming and we finally heard it today so Valve officially announced today via press release December 2nd that Steam Broadcasting, the beta, has now gone live. So you can literally stop this podcast right now or keep it going because it's just audio and go onto your Steam right now. Go to your settings, go to account, change where it says beta participation to Steam beta update. And as soon as you start your next game, you are broadcasting, ladies and gentlemen. So let's explain how that works and let's explain and then we'll get into why this is important, especially if you're still kind of new to this whole concept of Twitch TV, of, of game broadcasting, of game sharing. You still don't really understand it. You're maybe new to the community and you don't understand the appeal. And I get that because most people, when they first hear about the idea of somebody streaming their gameplay session online for other strangers to watch, including the friends, most people especially a couple of years back, would, would say, that's crazy. Why would I want to sit and watch somebody else play video games when I could play it myself? And we'll get in, like, I think at this point we understand why somebody would want to do that, but I'll get into it. But first, let's run down for all of you in the know who are currently broadcasting, who are currently particip participants within the community, you can get this going as of now. So let's explain. If you haven't read the press release, let's explain how this works. So as soon as you turn on your game, immediately, it goes into this this broadcast area. Now that's not to say that, for, like, as soon as you play your next game, that oh, you know, somebody's gonna watch me, you know, be a total noob at this game. I don't want somebody to see this. Don't worry, Valve's got you covered. There's basically four options, and, and the way this works is that when you're broadcasting, it's kind of like you're broadcasting into oblivion until a friend on your list chooses to watch your broadcast. That's when you're technically going quote unquote live. And what happens is when that friend on your list first chooses to watch you play live, and I think they'll be able to see this, uh, let's see here. What they do is they'll just go to their friend's name on the list, select watch game, which is located below the currently in game text, and they'll be presented with four options, which is only friends I invite can watch my games, and this is something you're going to see, not that the person watching your broadcast is going to see, but something that you're going to see. So only friends I invite can watch my games. That's option number one. Option number two, friends can request to watch my games, which is actually the default. So basically, anytime one of your friends chooses you on their friends list to watch a broadcast, they'll have to click accept. They won't just automatically be able to watch you playing games. Option three Friends can watch my games, no problem. They don't have to click to accept. They can just click on my name, watch whatever I'm playing, and that's it. And then, uh, finally, anyone can watch my games. And that's the one I was, I was hoping to hear because without that option, it would be a very limited type of... Of, of function, you know, you, you would probably just share it with, with the, the depth of your friends list, depending on how big or small that is, and that's where it'd be. But thankfully, they are gonna allow the public option, and this is essentially gonna show up in the game hub, kind of like when you're on, for, for instance, on the PlayStation 4, you go to what's new, and anybody on your friends list who is currently broadcasting, it'll have a bubble showing what they're broadcasting, that they're live right now, you can click on it, 
go directly to their broadcast. It's gonna work similarly on the Steam Hub. Okay, so let's keep going over the details and then we'll kind of get into why this is important, where I need to see it going from this. So, going over again the particulars, the requirements for broadcasting is that you have to have a non-limited account, meaning that you've, if you've made at least one purchase on your account, you have a non-limited account, so you're free to broadcast, and also that your account is in good standing, meaning that it's not community banned, that you're not an excessive troller, and that you know, you're, you're good for the community. Supported platforms, basically at this point, you just need your Steam client or Google Chrome or Apple Safari, it'll run. Windows 7 and 8 are the launch platforms for the beta, and they have promised that Linux OS X and Vista are coming soon with future updates. So again, let's 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 uh, let's talk about the reality of what happens when you press play. So when you start playing the game, only the game is visible. All right. So addressing your privacy concerns, are people going to be able to see the rest of my desktop or my PC? Not unless you allow it. So by default. What's gonna be shown is only the game and that's it. But there is gonna be an option if, if, you, if you trust people who are watching you and if it's just a friends only session, you can enable it so that they can see your desktop whenever the game is not in play. So you do, there is customizability. I like that they're, they're, they're already thinking of things that aren't even really in the Twitch interface. And what else? No-nos. Let's talk about some no-nos. In terms of what's not allowed, of course, the usual offenders, porn, offensive, inappropriate content, but where's leaked content? And, and, and interestingly, they, they, they also include glitches and exploits. And we're going to get into this uh, because this is going to be a bit of a longer segment for third party news. I really want to get into another story about glitches and exploits that's kind of bugging me a bit. But uh, saving that for in the next few minutes, let's get back to this. So you can't show glitches and exploits of games or cheating, the usual threats of violence, harassment, racism, sexism, and bigotry. So this place definitely isn't 4chan. Copyrighted material, soliciting, begging, auctioning, raffling, selling, advertising, and referrals. Okay, so pretty standard laundry list. Again, I take issue with the glitches and exploits thing, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that a bit more when we talk about what's going on with Call of Duty and Activision. Uh, finally, in terms of what the to glean, we can glean from today's press release on the Steam Broadcasting Beta, is that unfortunately you cannot archive your broadcasts as of yet. Now, that's not a big deal. That's something that'll get patched in later for sure, but there is definitely a workaround for that. So let's say you start broadcasting today, but then you have an amazing session. Like you, 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 you foresee, or at least you foresee that you're probably gonna have an amazing session and that you wanna store this. I would advise, at least for now, if you have something like open broadcast or software or XSplit, just basically run Steam through XSplit as well and either do a local recording and I can't guarantee this because I haven't tried it myself. I, I literally read the press release before I started broadcasting. I may try this later, but I, I, I don't see why you couldn't simulcast. So while you're broadcasting on Steam, you could also be feeding that through XSplit if you have the paid version, of course, and you can send that to Twitch or Ustream or wherever you decide to stream. And, and of course, if you don't have the paid version of XSplit, you can always do a screen capture and run audio through an external mic, but that that's a, maybe another podcast. Actually, you can you can even get tips from an earlier, uh, what was it, roundtable that we did near the beginning of Joystick Justice League about that. Finally, you can share your broadcasting by inviting friends to watch, but it doesn't mention anything about Twitter functional twi Twitter functionality or Facebook linkage or or Instagram or Reddit or anything like that. But it's still early. At least we've got it up and running now. Let's talk about this in a general perspective. So I, I really like the fact that they're taking the fuss out of broadcasting, which has already started to get easier in the PlayStation 4, Xbox One era. I mean, I started doing Twitch about two years ago, and, and there was a lot there, and there was a lot of hardware and software you needed to make work together. A lot of troubleshooting that needed to happen. A lot of things needed to work with other things like microphones, capture cards, you name it. It's 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 they've dialed that back. They've made it more ma they've made it, they've made it more streamlined in the PlayStation 4, Xbox One era. For instance, on the PS4, as you all know, it's it's as simple as clicking the share button, sharing your broadcast, and even with the recent PlayStation 4 firmware update, they've actually added a lot more customization options. But what I like is that Steam is making this even easier. It's like you don't even need a client. You don't need XSplit. You don't need a capture card. You don't need to click the share button. You are already sharing from the moment you launch your game. 
And, and like I said, the first time I read that, I'm like, wow, that that's kind of intrusive. Like I, maybe I don't want to share my gameplay. But the fact is, is that you constantly have a quick set of options to customize who sees that content and where. And and, and what I would like to see Valve add is, is just a nice quick pop-up interface where before you go to broadcast, boom, you click your privacy settings like you do on the PS4 and that way at least you're not constantly having to go through this cumbersome route of going through the options menu and, and changing your privacy privacy settings. Also kind of forcing, I don't I don't like the idea of forcing your friends to have to click on your broadcast as well. I, I, I could see where problems can get, that could become problematic in terms of people trying to prevent certain users from accessing their broadcasts. I think it should be as it was traditionally, giving more power to the actual broadcaster to shape that experience. But it's still early. I like what they're doing, and even Twitch likes what they're doing because already Twitter VP of Marketing, Matthew, Matthew DiPietro, immediately responded to the press release, effectively congratulating Valve on getting into this new method of video game social networking and for just increasing the, so I'm not really saying this, but basically increasing the competitive nature of that market. And, and I like this because it's, now it's going to push Twitch to innovate even further. I mean, they've already started responding with with the the birth of the PS4, Xbox One streaming era in terms of, you know, like I said, streamlining the process, making it easier to access, uh, making it more customizable. But there's still a lot of work to go. For instance, on the PS4 right now, you still can't re really report, like there's not a really good way to say ban um, users who are harassing you or set up mods. I mean, there's still a lot of work that has to go into those native interfaces. I mean, fortunately, if you're if you're savvy with using your browser-based Twitch site and you and you command your whole operation from there, you you can still accomplish a pretty good broadcast and keep it under control, but at this point, the, 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 the average user of Twitch doesn't understand how deep that goes. And, and to be honest, PlayStation and Microsoft haven't done a really good job of educating people on how they can control their broadcasts and avoid harassment and trolls. Um, so, that, And I think that's something that I, I, I'm personally going to kind of try to do. I, I think maybe I'll start a new show like Tales from the, t the Depths of Twitch or something like that where I share my experiences of what can and can go right and what can definitely go wrong because I think I've made every mistake in the book on Twitch TV under my 24-bit heroes label and I've I've gained subscribers I've lost lots of them but you know you learn every day so this is still a new frontier and I, what I like I said before it's gonna force Twitch to innovate in terms of how Valve is simplifying uh, the interface now it, it remains to be seen because Twitch is so well established within the game community are some of the major Twitch personalities going to start moving over to over to Steam and leaving Twitch behind? I don't think so because again, like I said before, if you know your way around a capture card and your X split or your open broadcaster interface or whatever you use, there's always ways to simulcast your broadcast on Steam and Twitch or Ustream. So there's lots of ways to get around with that. Point is, is that in the larger picture, Video game streaming on Valve, whether it be Valve, Twitch, Ustream, wherever you decide to get your streaming fix from, this is essentially the future of not only social networking gaming, like the ability to have the virtual coach co-op, to, to meet new people who are interested in the same games you are, and to have a dialogue over the broadcaster or in the chat forum while you're broadcasting your video. I've had so many incredible experiences and met so many incredible people, had so many fascinating conversations based on just a random game I was broadcasting, something I said about the game or something I said offhandedly and it sparked conversation. And it's just like having your buddies on the couch next to you like we, like back in the NES days when we'd sit and you know troll each other or you know razz each other over a game and, and that's what happens but on a virtual level now. So. You know, gamers, it's it's a new way for gamers to meet similar minded people. But like we've said many times before, it's the it's the birth of like the new marketing for the video games industry. You know, gone are the days where we had to purely rely on a GameSpot review or an IGN review or an EGM review to, to get the final picture on a game. And, and as Gamergate showed us, and as it continues to show us into month three with the Gamergate hashtag, that you know ethics in the mainstream gaming industry are completely under under suspicion right now 
and are, are falling by the wayside to, to online personalities, to YouTube personalities who we trust more. People like Total Biscuit, people like Boogie2988, people like Northern Lion, PewDiePie. Those are like the new gatekeepers and the people, the, the influential people who are gonna make or break video games. And, and it's not just the big people like Total Biscuit or Boogie or Review Tech USA, it's, it's each and every one of you and me involved. Like we all have a role to play in the fortunes of these companies in the sense that now Twitch has enabled us and, and YouTube as well to find out if a game is actually good beyond the corporate hype. We can see a real gamer like us playing that game online and telling us the bare truth. And even if they're it's it's like you get to decide for yourself and i and i've noticed that i've sold so many people on rare and independent games through my channel just from them sitting and watching for 10 minutes and me giving a rundown and saying you know you got to play shovel knight it's it's incredible it's one of the finely finest cr like <laughs> i can't speak right now it's one of the most finely tuned indie platformers of, of recent memory and it's it's the price point is incredible you got to play this support canadian gaming and they're like, cool. And I, and I just, I, and, I, and then I go over a bullet list of why they would like that. And, and that's so much more honest and direct than what we were used to previously reading uh, magazines or reading a corporate website. So again, streaming's not going anywhere else. Wow, this, this went uh, quite a long way. I've got about three minutes left. So check it out. Go on your Steam client right now. Try it out with your friends. Test it out. It's still in beta. Give all of your feedback. I wanna see this be successful. All right, so I've got about three minutes left for third party news and I wanna talk, there was much more that I wanted to get into, but the main thing I wanna get into right now is the flip side of grassroots uh, gaming marketing, like what I was just talking about with, with players themselves promoting and hyping the games through their own channels. Let's see the dark side of that with some news last week that kind of burned up the internet with Activision declaring war on Call of Duty Advanced Warfare glitch and exploit videos. Uh, and, I, and I saw a few articles on this and I noticed specifically one YouTube user by the name of Pure Monsters and I watched the video. He actually, in the first part of the video where he's showing you some glitches and exploits, uh, well, or where they would have been because he wasn't allowed to show them anymore. He, he admitted to his fans that he had received a copyright strike from Activision uh, based on some glitches he had found in the comeback multiplayer map. And as soon as, I, 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 I guess he must have been partnered with Machinima because as soon as this happened, Machinima issued a release to all of their partner broadcasters warning them that all content creators will be receive copyright strikes from YouTube if they post glitches, cheats, and exploits from Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. Wow, what's a copyright strike? Big news, okay? If you're a YouTube broadcaster, that's big news, all right? This isn't even like a warning. This isn't even third, like a third party match content ID warning that I received early on from a chiptune track that I used and it was kind of like a slap on the wrist, but I was, a, I was allowed to keep the video up and my, my channel's still in good standing. A strike is when you violated copyright in some in some really egregious way these strikes can, can really hamper your progress as a youtube content creator down the line i mean even one strike will limit your functionality in terms of you know your ability to you know put up customizable thumbnails and do live broadcasts but when you get three of these copyright strikes you're finished you're done your youtube channel is deleted, your videos are deleted, it's over. Good luck trying to get back in. You'll probably have to go under a pseudonym or something like that. But I just I just don't feel like the punishment fits the crime. I think that Activision's being a little too hard on players. Let's read some statements first. I'll get back to my thoughts on this. I wanna, I wanna firstly give you the statements made by Activision in this manner. Uh, I also wanna talk about a rebuttal that uh, Chris Healy of GamesNotch.com made to this situation, but first, Let's read Activision's statement to Eurogamer. Okay, so they basically said that we're excited that so many fans are having fun playing the game and posting videos of their gameplay. We love watching the videos ourselves. Occasionally, some folks post videos that promote cheating and unfair exploits. As always, we keep an eye out for these videos. Our level of video games claim, our level of video claims hasn't changed. We are appreciative of the community support in helping to ensure that everyone has the best playing experience possible, more corporate jargon. All right, and of course, Machina responded to their viewers saying, guys, this is what's happening. If you wanna keep your YouTube, I'm paraphrasing right now, but if you wanna keep your YouTube account in good standing, please stop submitting these glitch exploit videos and just play fair and accordingly. Well, 
Chris Healy of GamesNosh.com wasn't having any of that. And I'm going to read a couple of statements he made to kind of wrap up this, this section on third-party gaming and what I feel about this whole controversy around really Activision imposing some draconian measures in, in terms of punishing content creators for not towing the line. Chris Healy, I'm going to, I'm going to quote a few things he said on his article at GamesNosh.com. Activision, uh, in parentheses, have admitted to using their ability to claim copyright infringement in a manner not in accordance with its purpose. The ability to claim copyright infringement is not, however, a weapon to be welded in a manner which furthers the company's needs. This sort of abuse from Activision is a kind of censorship that has existed for years within the YouTube community, often used by small producers and video creators to silence criticism about them. And of course, he adds nicely here, as seen recently with the Zoe Quinn scandal, of course, wearing his politics on his sleeve. And I'm sure you know that Games Nosh is a pro Gamergate site, so there you go. And I completely agree to, to a degree. I think they're slightly apples and oranges in that situation, but I see where he's getting. Anyway, going on, he says that if you, he argues that if YouTube allows such a high profile case of selective censorship that takes advantage of a loophole within its rules to go unpunished, then the floodgates will burst open for everyone. This will be setting a precedent that the developers, publishers, and content creators can pick and choose which sort of videos from the community get to stay, presumably ones that give you good reviews and praise and file copyright strikes against those which they deem unfavorable. Okay, so I see where Halo's going with this. I gotta wrap this up because we're going over time right now, but... Um, I understand that it seems like First Amendment rights are being infringed upon here, the, the right to free speech, to free expression on YouTube, and like you're saying, if, if, you, if you allow this to go through, then who's saying other companies can't find other ways to abuse this copyright system? And I think I have a solution. We need a new system where it's like three strikes to a strike in, in these types of situations, because Activision, you have to understand, Younger gamers especially go crazy over glitches, okay? Now let's look at the pros and cons of this. Glitches are part of video gaming community. There's, a, there's, there's just a subculture of it. You'll never make it go away. And to, to give such a, a draconian fine, like a huge strike, based on something that may not have been, that may not have malicious intent behind it, it's, it's, it's just too severe. I think you need to, to warn these people because there are people, yes, that are trying to spread exploits and you know upset the balance of a multiplayer match. That's been a problem of Call of Duty for years, okay? Cheaters, exploiters, hackers have ruined every Call of Duty successfully after, year after year. You don't believe me? Go try putting in Modern Warfare 2 right now. Go to try, go try to go play a fair and balanced game of Terminal. It will not happen. You will have people teleporting around the map. It's ridiculous and I'm surprised with all that money that Activision never fixed these problems. It's as if now we've got our new Call of Duty game out this year. We don't give a shit about last year's game, so fuck it. You know, the, the, the trollers can have their day. So you know what? As long as they're never going to fix these problems with their games, as long as they're going to continue to allow glitches and exploits into Call of Duty, people are going to make videos about them, so slap them on the wrist. Three strikes to a strike. Three offenses, and you get an official strike. But not until you've com completed at least two or three of those glitch offenses and, and shown that you're developing a pattern. Because most people, if they get that notice the first time, they'll probably, most good hearted people will probably stop making those videos. The trolls are gonna test your patience and go for that third strike and they deserve to have their channels down. So there it is, I've gone long. That's uh, part one of JJL Live episode three, third party news roundup. Sound off in the comments, this is a very controversial issue. I wanna know what you think about this. Stay tuned for part two with Nintendo news and we're gonna be getting into uh, some new patents that are very interesting and also some other hot stuff too. I don't wanna give too much away. Stay tuned, we'll be back. Mike Frisios for the Joystick Justice League. Welcome back, Joystick Justice League, to episode three of JJL Live. I'm your host, Mike Frusios. This is part two 
the best and worst of Nintendo news from last week and into this week. So let's start off with a little bit of fun controversy. Um, Nintendo filed a patent last June with the U.S. Patent Trade Office or the USPTO, and it was finally made public last week via article I read on TechCrunch that they were going to be developing technology to extend the Game Boy library to mobile devices and even the backseat displays of airplanes. And essentially, this is to counteract the emergence and the popularity, I mean, really, super popularity uh, of Game Boy emulators, such as Virtual Boy Advanced on mobile devices. They're prolific. They're prolific. I mean, I see my nephews and their friends uh, playing Game Boy Advance emulators all the time on their iPhones. It's huge. And if they're not playing those, they're playing some sort of, of Super Mario knockoff. Like, I, there's that one game starting the Leprechaun that I saw that was a total... <laughs> well playing, but, you know, total knockoff uh, of Super Mario Brothers 1. And, and Nintendo realizes that, that people that are slowly moving over to the mobile market still crave that Nintendo experience. And, and Nintendo has been pretty vocal in the past that they're not intending to get into the mobile market, even though they've we've constantly seen them filing similar patents like this before. They, they keep assuring their, custom, that, that their, their customer base that, no, we are sticking to the 3DS, we're sticking to the Wii U, we're, we're not into the mobile market, although we, we're, we're not gonna say no to spinoffs. So we have seen this happen slowly, where Pokemon now is showing up on the App Store via trading card battle games and such, the, the floodgates are opening. And, and, and it really comes down to the fact that I think eventually Nintendo's gonna have to do something about this. They, they, they can't ignore the menace of the mobile market much longer. We already see it in, in hardware sales. The 3DS, even though it's been successful and it still is killing the Vita in terms of global sales, hasn't really reached the heights of the original DS, and because that was a different era. When the DS was out, you know, the App Store was still in its infinity, and a lot of the people, especially younger consumers who now use the App Store, really didn't have access to their own touch devices yet. They didn't have their own phones or, or touches, so really the only way for them to play mobile games was a DS. That's why it was so big, and, and there weren't as many, like, you know, like I said, mobile gaming wasn't as big as it was today. But now, it's a huge industry, Here's the thing, you know, there's been a lot of patents filed Nintendo similarly, and because of their anti-mobile stance, you know, people like Review Tech, and I saw his video, he made a good point that this is most likely not a game plan for, for 2015 or 2016, but rather what similar to what Apple does on a frequent basis where they're just trying to protect their IP by, by basically policing other illegal emulators like the Virtual Boy Advance. But, they, you know, they, they do admit that that gamers want these things, and, and if, if they could provide, as the patent suggests, a way of fine-tuning that experience, providing clear graphics, better audio, more finely tuned game mechanics that actually work on that particular device, rather than a half-assed port, I, I think that this is something that's gonna have to happen. But let, let's talk about some of the controversy around this, because <laughs> it was funny, after this this came out, there was a, a very kind of clickbaity article that came out from a writer by the name of Tiro Katenin who writes for BGR.com and he kind of created, created like a mild controversy last week. Got a lot of people upset because Yahoo News picked up on this article where he wrote, is Pokemon killing Nintendo? And you know, for, for people who are accustomed to just kind of reading headlines, getting outraged, not actually reading the article, I'm sure people got upset. Now, Monday Matt goes into this at length, and especially Eric Kane of Forbes made his response to this article, and, and Monday Matt has a very good video on this on the Pokemon killing Nintendo situation. You should check it out. But just if you haven't seen his video or followed the articles, I'll kind of summarize what's happening. So Katenin of BGR feels that the incredible success of the recent Pokemon games for 3DS, it was, uh, forgive me, it was... Uh, uh, Alpha, Alpha Ruby, Alpha, Alpha Sapphire Omega Ruby, or maybe I'm getting them backwards. I apologize if I'm getting them backwards right now. But regardless, they're at the top of the sales charts, and, and nobody's surprised. Whenever Pokemon drops, it, it kind of takes over the market, and, and I'm sure it's going to continue into Christmas because I, I, I know that most kids prior to Christmas probably got one of the two games, and then their parents will most likely buy them the second game for Christmas, and that's how it goes. But he, but Katenin feels that. This success is, is toxic in the sense that it's just going to continue to perpetuate 
kind of the dumb-headed attitude of what most of us feel represents Nintendo's executives. I mean, you know, God love Iwata and Fiza May. I do have some problem, and especially with Miyamoto and, and his philosophies concerning next gen. You've seen it before. I have my 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 issues with with their with the long-term ramifications of their business plan. I can appreciate that Nintendo's trying to scale back, trying to develop more development costs to fewer titles and make them better overall than a lot of the rush titles we see on competing consoles. I get that. Problem is though, they're not thinking towards the future. We've seen this in the past where where it is clear that Reggie fils does not understand why streaming is important to video gaming and why Nintendo's kind of missed the boat on that front. It's clear that they're reacting to Sony's and Microsoft's moves and just kind of taking this hurt in the corner stance of, oh, well, you know, the PS4, who cares that it's it's leading the market right now? All the games are the same as the Xboxes and they're all rushed to market, but, but people are still buying them, okay? And yes, your hardcore fanboys and fangirls are still buying your Wii U's, and I'm going to buy one too because I, I think that there's enough games to buy it, but... Regardless, the, these guys seem to be spinning their wheels, and that's what Katenin's saying. It's just like the fact that Pokemon is selling so well on a non-Android or a non-iPhone device is is kind of like it's it's not the wake-up call that execs need to, to change their business strategies to start thinking about how to compete with the mobile market and move into the 21st century. They're not they're not they're they're just gonna spin in their wheels. I get what he's saying, and, and as a and that's the thing, Katanen supports this patent and wants it to be reality because he feels that if you add the virtual console library to the App Store or to the Android Marketplace, wow, that's going to be crazy. All of a sudden, you're not going to need all these knockoffs anymore. You're going to have officially endorsed Nintendo versions of Mario, of Zelda, Metroid, F-Zero, Animal Crossing. I mean, he makes a really great point that if you throw Dr. Mario on the App Store... Watch out Candy Crush. I mean, seriously, I would rather play Dr. Mario than Candy Crush, especially if I know there aren't gonna be microtransactions and stuff like that. It just makes sense for them to do this. Now, on the other side of the coin, Eric Kane of Forbes feels that this is going to dilute Nintendo, that this, this is gonna go against their new conservative approach to gaming where, like we said last week or the week before, that rather than putting out a whole bunch of games all year, they just focus more into games, like more energy and resources into flagship titles, flagpole titles actually, like Smash Brothers, Mario Kart, the new Zelda coming out next year, Splatoon, you know. And he feels that if you if you start allowing Nintendo games to get out onto the marketplace, that they're not gonna put that, he feels that Nintendo's not gonna put that energy into it, that you're gonna get a bunch of half-ass ports that don't work on a touch interface, that don't translate well, and that's effectively going to dilute the, 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 the Nintendo franchises, which right now are very controlled. It's very controlled in how you access this. You have to get on certain platforms to play Mario or Zelda or Metroid. He feels it's going to lose there, and it's going to go against Nintendo's philosophy. And really, Nintendo's philosophy, Kane feels, is that it doesn't fit in with 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 uh, this whole pay to unbreak system that's been popularized by Clash of Clans. At the same time, though, we see there's also a pushback against that free-to-play mentality, which is already going out the door now that Apple's getting rid of the terminology and now that South Park has pretty much exposed the fraud for what it is. So I see where Kane's going, and Kane argues that instead of just kind of porting over old titles that may be increasingly irrelevant to younger consumers, rather they gotta start in investing in smaller scale, maybe more puzzle-oriented spin-offs of other bigger games. For instance, maybe a smaller scale version of Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker or, or, or something to that effect. My thing, and, and I gotta wrap up, I, I think I'm gonna extend this Nintendo coverage and I'm gonna skip Microsoft and Sony this week or maybe just kind of scale them down. I'm really going over time this week, but there's there's a, something else I gotta discuss in regards to Nintendo. I'm probably gonna need another five, 10 minutes to discuss it. Wrapping up this part, I think that we can, and Monday Matt, again, go watch his video. He goes into a deeper discussion of what happened between Kane and Katenin and what he feels. I feel kind of as mundane Matt feels, I'm not gonna speak for him, but I feel that you can you can converge both sides of this debate here. I think that not only Nintendo should be taking the Activision approach and the EA approach of taking their big franchises and making smaller spin-off games like the Witcher Adventure game or the Call of Duty Advanced Warfare mobile app or the or even Rockstar's iFruit app companion app for GTA 5 which has its own games on it. I mean, that's even though it's not making tr incredible tremendous money for them yet, 
at, over time, as these big giants get into the mobile market, they'll, they'll provide competition for the for the people who've already secured their foothold, like like King Games and Glue and all all these these mobile giants. So I think we can converge. I think that not only can they make the smaller scale games, but they need to bring the virtual console to the mobile market with dedicated a dedicated team that ensures that these ports work in a contextual sense so that Mario has a different control scheme and different tuning than Zelda. They're not all just kind of poured over, but they're actually lovingly brought over to a mobile interface. And let's take it one step further. Let's look at Sony's approach to remote play with the Z3 where you can, if you get the Z3 tablet or the phone and you buy that special clip, you can connect it to your DualShock 4 or DualShock 3 and basically have mobile PS4 remote play gaming on the go right in the palm of your hands without having a Vita. And I think Nintendo could do the same thing. I think, now let's just say you have the, the, the virtual console titles available on App Store, available on Android, then Nintendo could release at like Best Buy, Target, EB, Walmart, a special like retro styled controller, like an old school SNES controller or something like that, or something like that, that clips onto the bottom of your phone or tablet. Gangbusters, absolutely gangbusters. All right, so that that's that's that's. I think that that even though again this is just another patent and probably just another way of securing IP against hackers and and exploiters and people who want to pirate their library. I think that we can, that Nintendo needs to make a go at this. I think and, and and the fact that they keep hammering at this patent shows that maybe that they 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 say that they're not into the mobile thing, but a magician like I said never reveals its tricks and and I'm sure they're preparing for some type of future. So. Let's keep going with a little bit of Nintendo news. I think I can, uh, yeah, you know, let's go for another maybe eight to 10 minutes here. I wanna talk about something else. That's going on with the 3DS um, in terms of its actual 3D technology based on a, a study that came out of France. And this was, this was reported by Games Industry Biz last week that France's health and safety executive, ANSES, cautions that children under six years of age should not be exposed to stereoscopic 3D technology which also extends to films, mobile apps, and as we're gonna get into the conversation, I'm gonna argue VR tech, and I've already done a bit of research on this, and the results are, sh the, the, the already, my, just my initial unreferenced research, I haven't even really begun to scratch the surface, is shocking to me in terms of what I, what some of the, the, the major roadblocks I anticipate with Project Morpheus and, and Oculus Rift, but we'll get into that. Let, let's first of all concentrate on what's, possibly wrong with the 3DS. So essentially there's this term uh, called virgins accommodation conflict that messes with both lenses ability to converge on a single object and bring it into clear focus. This is this is the why, like whenever you hear people complain about headaches or getting dizzy uh, watching like either VR or even like a 3D movie or something like that for an extended period of time, they start to, to feel discomfort. And, and the reason for this is because there's this, like I said, there's this problem where, where your eyes are trying to focus on a single object, your lens are, are resizing, and it's just, it's this virtual interface that has no semblance to reality, which is what your eyes have, have always been adjusted for, and that's why you can't handle it for long periods of time. So, what they're saying, they've, they've issued some recommendations, and, and what you have to do is you have to take everything of what I'm saying in this last part of the segment with a grain of salt, because the research is still very new, and even new scientists has already kind of responded to this article, uh, actually, sorry, this finding by the French health and safety executive that it really, the theory is slightly incorrect because it is not based on current research. And essentially, there is really no conclusive data illustrating long-term mental effects outside of short-term discomfort nausea. So I get it because, you know, VR, 3D technology, in terms of the scientific study of it, there, there, it really is a new phenomenon. And I think we're going to see a lot more coming out about this as we start to see uh, VR technology penetrate the market because let, let's face it 3d was always a gimmick from the start 3d is nothing new they tried 3d in the 50s in movie theaters it was a gimmick didn't last long it was relegated to amusement parks for like virtual roller coaster films and stuff like that they tried it again in the 70s again to spur box office sales it, it's always 
indicative of how short-sighted and stupid Hollywood can be in terms of they always try to find these gimmicks to get people back into movie theaters, <laughs> you know. Um, but anyway, so 3D, again, was was is, is slowly getting out of vogue now. It was, it was huge in the seventh generation. They really tried to push it. I always argued that the technology and that uh, it was not up to par to make 3D a feasible non-sickening viewing experience i've always argued that you need you need to be viewing something at like at least 48 frames if not 60 frames a second to make 3d technology look comfortable on a longer base but regardless they've they've, they've put out some recommendations that children under six should not be exposed to 3d technologies whatsoever so if they have a 3DS, make sure that dial is turned down. Or better yet, get them a 2DS. The 2DS doesn't have 3D technology. Also, children under the age of 13 should only use 3D technologies in moderation and that both they and their parents should be vigilant concerning any resulting symptoms. Why is this? Because the brain is developing. Not so much at 13, it still is, but especially under six, the, the, the visual senses are still developing and this can, this can basically mess with with their way of, of understanding perception over the long term if they're they if they're if they're too exposed to either 3D or even VR technology. Also, persons subject to certain visual disorders, i.e. disorders of accommodation, virgins, etc., and problems with balance should limit their exposure to these technologies, including in the context of occupational exposure. And I mean they have to mention that because Here's the thing, man. VR isn't just limited to gaming. Like already, many companies have approached companies like Sony and, and, and Oculus for for non-gaming applications. You're gonna see more of this, and, and I'm glad to see that. Even though, as New Scientist says, and, and it almost seems like they're kind of trying to block this research. It almost seems like they have an agenda here to actually push VR or 3D. But regardless, it's good to see at least a discussion coming out about this, because let's face this. All right. And sorry, Nintendo has responded, of course, to this article. I have to add that before I go on with VR. But Nintendo has responded saying, look, we've been very clear in our, our warnings on the hardware. If you read the manuals, the warnings that come up on the games that, yes, children under six should not be viewing 3D technology and that you have the option to turn that off. You always have the option to um, buy 2DS. And we always encourage gamers to limit their play sessions. So really, they, they, they're covering themselves. I think they could have done more about it in terms of you know consumer care, maybe make a video responding to it, and that way people uh, ingrate it more in their memories. But regardless, Nintendo responded, they covered themselves. What I'm more interested to wrap up this section on Nintendo news is what the implications of this report for the 3DS, what they mean for the oncoming onslaught of VR technology with Project Morpheus and all these other competitors, Oculus Rift and, all, and Gear, I was I, I was like, okay, this sounds like something that would be applicable to VR. I mean, really, when you think about it, you're, you're, you're wearing a head-mounted display and, and you're rendering an even more complex 3D image in front of your eyes with no reference to reality because your entire um, your entire scope of vision is covered by that headset, so you you can't really get out of it. You can't just like you you can't just like tip the glasses like your 3D glasses, readjust your vision and put them back on again. You're you're, you're in this thing to win it. So I, I decided right before I broadcasted this, I haven't done a lot of research because it it kind of it, it, I kind of clued into this idea before I pressed record. I'm thinking, okay, does this whole phenomenon? A virgin's accommodation conflict apply to VR gaming. So what I did was I typed in virgins, virgins accommodation conflict VR, and boom, lo and behold, first result was a post on Reddit. So again, like I said, with this whole section, I got about a minute left. Take this with a grain of salt because it's not referenced, but they are quoting some textbooks. So the Smoth user on Reddit said that I was reading a textbook chapter about 3D laparoscopic cameras for surgery, and a lot of the issues sounding similar to 3D are. VR headsets kind of came up. I'm paraphrasing a bit here. Um, it suggested that accommodation and virgins are critical for comfort and minimizing sickness. So she's wondering, okay, or he or she is wondering, what applications does this have for VR gaming? Because this sounds similar to other things I've read. And a user by the name of Doc underscore OK. I'm going to kind of uh, read some points because I'm running out of time here. But he basically said that there's no way of solving 
this conflict properly using the lens plus screen technology that is found in the Rift. I'm paraphrasing, I'm not directly quoting here. Uh, two alternative display methods for eight head mounted displays or HMDs actually exist in the form of light field displays and true holographic screens, but both of these technologies are so premature that you'll, you won't see these for years. So right now, we're relying on head mounted displays, and the problem that he says with the Rift is that, what does he say, that the screen is focused at infinity. On, on, on the visual spectrum, meaning that to see virtual objects clearly, the viewer's eyes have to focus on infinity, even if the virtual objects are much closer to the viewer. So what, what is the problem from that? So let's just say there's an object that comes close to you. Yes, you can register that that, that object is close, but because your eyes are focused on the horizon point, that object is gonna appear blurry in front of you and is gonna cause headaches and discomfort because your eyes are constantly trying to focus in between the background and the foreground where the game is locked on focusing on the background. And then, you know, Doc uh, under, underscore OK uh, actually suggests that they could have placed the focus plane at the average distance instead where they would expect 3D objects to appear in typical applications. I'm gonna leave this open to the experts. I gotta wrap up this section. We went over long, but honestly, if you've done some of the research, Hit me up in the comment section. Link me, link me to some research. I want to look more into this because this could be damning. This could be the thing that proves that we are not ready for VR gaming. And, and we're already starting to see. We already saw the head of Take Two say that he's he's not really feeling VR yet, but he's go, he's going to be on top of it if it does work. This could be the thing that both Oculus and Project Morpheus are missing that could render this just another virtual boy. I'm really afraid after hearing stuff like this. If you're an expert on this subject, sound off in the comments. We'll be back with some very quick Microsoft and Sony news and then wrap up this podcast with The Greek Speaks where I talk about why frame rate matters to video gaming. Stay tuned, I'm Mike Frusios. Welcome back to Ice Justice League to episode three of JGL Live. I'm Mike Frusios with your weekly video game news roundup insight and commentary. We're going to part three right now with both Microsoft and Sony news because I'm running out of time and I still want to get into the Greek Speaks final segment where I discuss why frame rate matters to gaming. So let's let's get going right now. Let's not waste words. Let's start with Microsoft. First, the good news is that they clearly have by consumer surveys and initial sales reports, one Black Friday by a pretty wide margin. Um, basically between the Xbox One and the 360 in terms of actual consoles sold, they had 62% market, market share versus Sony's 32% between the PS3 and PS4, and then of course 6% going to the Wii U. Now what's interesting about all these stats is that over 90% of the console purchases made during Black Friday were actually bundled with a game, and 75% of the people polled said that the bundled game definitely influenced their purchase. And um, in terms of price, the price drop, 71% cited buying the Xbox One because of the price drop versus 48% of PlayStation users buying it because of the PS4's price. So uh, it shows you that Blake Jorgensen was right. When I was talking earlier on JGL Live on another podcast about how he felt that Microsoft, with their price drop and their value-added bu value added bundles of Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, Assassin's Creed Unity, and Black Flag, and I believe there was also another one for Master Chief Collection, that combined with the $50 price drop would propel them through the holiday season and, and put them on a more equal footing with uh, Sony's PlayStation 4 going into 2015, and it looks like this is the case. Now, as I said before as well, is that this is just short-term thinking. Don't think that this is just going to automatically propel Xbox into like this massive lead because where as Sony is kind of taking the hit this holiday in terms of you know taking a back seat to Smash Brothers, Mario Kart, Master Chief Collection, Sunset Overdrive. They're taking a back seat this holiday, but they're making moves, okay? And responding to some of Microsoft's gaffes to poise themselves for 2015. We already know that Sony's got a major list of exclusives starting to come out in February. We've got in March, we have Bloodborne, we have the Order 1886. 
we have uh, Planet Side 2, which is supposed to go into beta at the end of the year. So a lot of big guns coming. Of course, Arden Charted 4 at the end of next year, and who else, who, and who knows what David Jaffe is supposed to announce this weekend coming up at the PlayStation Experience. Yes, it is confirmed. I gotta mention this real quick, that David Jaffe, the creator of God of War and Twisted Metal, will be revealing his new IP, and be careful because he was trolling people like myself on Twitter who drank the Kool-Aid and actually believed when he posted that, oh yeah, we're gonna reveal the new God of War, that's for sure. So yeah, it's most likely not gonna be God of War, but regardless, there are some exclusives in Sony's favor. Now, when I mentioned uh, about a minute ago that Sony is responding to Microsoft's gaffes, especially in the foreign arena, let's look at what's going on in Japan that has been kind of lighting the internet on fire. News that Microsoft's Japanese boss Takashi Sensui has resigned as the chief of Xbox Japan and will actually be replaced by a former 25 years Sony staffer, Takahashi Minami, who actually joined back in July, so it's now official. He'll be taking over Xbox Japan to help out the, the ailing uh, franchise within the Japanese market. And I mean, really, like I was just reading a report from Luke Carmali of IGN, just looking at some of the, the, the horrible stats. The Xbox One has only sold just under 40,000 units in Japan, and about 23,000 of these were sold at launch in September, whereas the 360 actually doubled these numbers in its first two days in 2005. These are actually the lowest numbers. I'm sorry to laugh, but it's just like, it, it, it's been clear in the past that Microsoft is an American developer trying to get into a foreign marketplace, and I don't think they're gonna understand the needs of the Asian gamer as well as Sony does. But regardless, lowest numbers for Japanese console launch in rec recent years, and the PS4, by contrast, has sold more than 300,000 units since its own launch just this past February. So I think it's pretty clear between Nintendo and uh, Sony that they have kind of a lock on the Asian markets. And, and when we turn over to Sony News, I'm gonna explain how the Chinese factor is going to also uh, multiply this. So I've got about a couple minutes left on this segment. Um, let's keep going with Microsoft real quickly. Um, NeoGAF reported that via Media Crates that the figures show that only 70, 776 Xbox, Xbox One units sold last week compared to the PS4 and Wii U with 12,400 12, and 9,600 sold respectively. So you can see the trend that the Xbox had a, had a fairly decent launch in Japan although even then it's like we, we saw the launch day photos of all those boxes and, and the non lineups when it actually launched and it just, it was just, it was terrible. Um, you can see that the momentum has slowed and that's, that's not surprising. I mean, Microsoft serves a very North American audience. They're very focused on shooters, you know, American, you know, hero action games. Whereas now we, we already understand that the Japanese game de dif uh, tastes are much different. They're more into like RPGs, strategy games, visual novels, monster hunter games mobile games it's a much they're not as big into like the first person shooters i mean it's not like to say that asians don't play call of duty or whatever call of duty online is very big in china actually but overall tastes are a lot different um in the east versus the west and i don't think microsoft ever really understood that phil spencer in hindsight gets it i mean he did tweet out as a response to a fan that you will see jrpgs on xbox one but it's not clear what those are going to be he hasn't announced whether he's made any partnerships with like atlas or or oh like i mean i only want to act like i'm an expert here i'm even just I, i've just been introducing myself but there's there's no there's no indication that you're ever going to see tales of exilia or nino kuni or or the game or level five announce a game for the xbox one it's just it almost seems just kind of like a tweet to show that they're thinking about it but they're not really committing all right so we got about a minute left um well, let's extend this, this sequence, and then maybe I'll just kind of extend the show by about five minutes. So we'll go a little bit over an hour, but it's okay. Um, let's finish off this section with some Sony news. So while Xbox is failing horribly in Japan, Sony's doing okay, obviously, because, you know, it's the PS4. It's, it's got with Japanese gamers. But also, penetration into the Chinese market is about to start on December 11th. So if you've been following what's going on in the Chinese game industry, the 14-year-old ban on consoles 
in China was actually lifted last January, allowing for overseas competitors and, and even like competitors like Nintendo or Sony or Microsoft to start selling their consoles to Chinese customers via the Shanghai Free Trade Zone. Um, of course, it would be limited to the Chinese government's strict rules on censorship, of course. I don't think that the games, once they get localized, are going to be exactly the same as you see over here. But it shows a willingness for the Chinese government to expand the 21st century and to allow their citizens to get into gaming. Because, honestly, just doing some research on the Chinese game industry via report from the Chinese, the China Game Industry Annual Conference's China Games Party, I found out some pretty interesting things that this is a big market. This is a really, like, exponentially over, over many years. From 2008 to 2013, the growth of the China games industry is just tremendous from, from a, from a three, $3 billion industry in 2008 to, what is it, $13 billion last year. And, and it's mostly in the PC market because that's pretty much what they have. They haven't, the, the, the mo most modern Chinese gamers aren't accustomed to having a console. At this point up till now, they've had mobile and they've had PC. And what do we understand about PC gaming? It's usually rooted in strategy, in MOBAs, in MMOs. That is what is popular in China. They're not into like a lot of things that we're into here, like, you know, first first person shooters and third person action games they're more into strategy but they are adopting i mean look like uh chinese developer uh tencent has been responsible for localizing assassin's creed i believe and especially call of duty online so it shows that the the, the market is growing and, and sony is tapping into this because eventually once you start seeing like we're seeing in brazil happening right now and a lot of these Latin communities, which are starting to create their own game communities and are, and are getting those titles out through Sony's, um, you know, uh, third world indie partnerships. Now you're going to see in China, they're going to start to develop their own kind of industry. We're going to start to see something that's different from other Asian games. Whereas right now, a lot of North Americans understand what constitutes a Japanese game, what a, what a JRPG is, or, 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 or what a Monster Hunter clone is, is about, or what a Pokemon type of game is. Like, we understand kind of, or even like games like Had a Full Boyfriend, you know, the pigeon dating simulator that's coming out soon for PS4 and Vita. We understand there's a certain quirk and something different to the Japanese psyche, and I think we're going to see that coming out of Chinese game development as well. Possibly the birth of the CRPG or, or the CRTS or, or something crazy. But all we know is that if you're a PlayStation fan, at some point, once these games start coming out the gate, we'll eventually start seeing the cream of the crop start to get localized over to North America. And that's just going to benefit gamers as a whole. All right, so I got to wrap up this uh, this section on Sony and Microsoft news, but one quick uh, correction. Um, based on recent Sony Outlook, I got to mention this real quickly before we go that Sony has announced uh, last week that they're gonna be getting out of the TV and mobile markets and focusing, I think, 25% more resources on the PlayStation brand, I, about an increase of, uh, what, what were we looking at here? I had the figures in front of me. I think it was like, um, fuck, 13.6 billion or something like that. What was it? Uh, yeah, 13.6 billion USD is what they're gonna be investing into strengthening the PlayStation brand. And that's really been fueled by various subscription costs like PlayStation Plus, Music Unlimited, PlayStation Now, all that fun stuff. So what's happening, if they're gonna be cutting their ties to the TV market, I mean, sorry, the mobile market especially, what does that mean for remote play on the Z3, that thing that you see all over the PlayStation store that they're hyping up right now? Are they gonna to continue to support it? I don't know. So maybe, despite all the positive reviews, I might hold off on getting that Xperia Z3 because I don't know how much longer Sony is gonna be uh, willing to dedicate resources to the device. And also gotta correct myself that I said earlier that up until now you couldn't find these Xperia devices at Rogers Canada. They've gotten into the Xperia game for better or worse now, so you can actually get the Z3 and the Z2 at Rogers. Okay, so stay tuned. I'm gonna wrap up uh, things in part four of JJL Live episode three with uh, another episode of The Greek Speaks where I go down the reasons why frame rate matters to video gaming and in what context. Stay tuned.
Welcome back, Joystick Justice League, to episode three of JJL Live. I'm your host, Mike Frusios, with this fourth part of my weekly podcast, rounding up the best and worst of news around the industry. Uh, some recent articles from Eurogamer caught my attention, and that's why this particular final segment, The Greek Speaks, this week is going to be about why frame rate matters. I've been I've been wanting to do an episode about this for a while now. I've been thinking about how to deliver it, and then some recent controversy within the PC gaming industry kind of gave me the rest of of my argument in terms of the impetus to record. So let's talk about frame rate. Let's really try to break this down. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes of this last segment trying to break down why frame rate matters in certain contexts and what developers need to understand going forward and also gamers what they need to understand about the genres of games they're playing and the requirements for each type of genre so that they can demand the best of the developers who are making the games that they purchase so controversy recently in the pc market as you know frame rate and resolution gate have become a big thing over the last year with the launch of the admittedly underpowered um ps4 and xbox one consoles and the wii u not being able to live up to even entry level PC gaming hardware that can handle 1080p 60 frames in most cases no problem and can even now get into 4k gamings it does seem like the 8th generation consoles are a bit behind that may change with cloud processing but I want to get into the PC gaming side because if you're a PC gamer and all those PC elitists out there you know like we like to call them or PC master race they're used to to 1080p and 60 frames over the last few years with with the emergence of cheaper better hardware as just a standard thing and, and if they want a variable frame rate or a, a, like a 30 like a lock 30 which is not actually available on many pc games they have the option to to customize the game to their liking okay they're not dependent on people like ubisoft to tell them that that games look more cinematic at 30. I mean, that's that's something I'll be getting into within this discussion. I'm be getting into that, but PC gamers are used to having those options. Console gamers, we're starting to see those come in, but in general, consoles are made to be user friendly. So I don't think that console developers want to get into adding all of these crazy visual audio visual options into the options menu to confuse their audiences. I would argue that they need to over time. We'll get into that as well. So frame rate there's still a lot of people who don't under, really understand the difference between 30 and 60 and, and how that affects the gaming experience and the simplest way and, and people say to me like how do i know if i'm playing something in 30 or 60 or at a variable frame rate and there's a very simple way play a video game and when you pan the camera left or right in a first person shooter or let's say you're playing a speed running platform and you move the screen moves left to right like a 2D game or a 3D game panning left and right up and down if it's a smooth movement of that camera without any hiccuping or strobing just very smooth with no jutting you're you're playing at 60 frames if you see a strobe effect like you'd see in the movies when a camera pans that's 30 or if you see screen tearing or, or really abrupt panning you're probably playing at something variable with v-sync on or off we'll get more into that soon let's talk about 60 because really there are certain games out there right now that should be 60 frames that aren't. I'm looking at you, Destiny, right now. You're the number one offender. That should have been 60 frames. You're not 30. It's not a game breaker. I know you have your audience, but you'd be better off at 60 with all the rest of the competition. Here's why. I believe, and now that I'm more of a, an avid reader of Digital Foundry, they've confirmed pretty much my theory of what types of genres pretty much today in terms of how they've evolved require 60 frames and at the bare minimum a lock 30 nothing variable because that messes with the playing experience but as these genres evolve they need 60. let's go over some of these i'm not going to say it's a conclusive list i'm still kind of playing with this and seeing how it rolls out but i can basically say let's go over the list here genres that need to be at 60 frames a second let's start with fighting games as you know Pretty much any major league esports associated fighter these days has to run at 60 on a professional level. I mean, you can play them at a lock 30 on PC or or some lower grade consoles or mobile devices, but if you're going to play on a competitive level, you got to run a quick paced, twitchy fighting game like Street Fighter 4, like Mortal Kombat, Injustice Gods Among Us, 
Tekken, you name it. You pick the fast, big fighting game out there. They're all twitchy. They're all fast paced. And, and that's the thing, anybody who knows how champions operate and why they win the way they do, they're counting frames. They depend on those minute de details to, to counter a certain stage of a combo or to, they, they study the way, say, Guile's hand moves when they're trying to block a sonic boom or something. It, it goes into that insane level of detail. And when you go at a substandard frame rate, you're taking control away from the player. So if you're going at 30 or even variable, suddenly, as Drive Club, as the Drive Club developers would explain, when you're going at a variable frame rate, you're messing up the, the control input to, to visual kind of relationship. I'm not putting it in scientific terms right now, but essentially when you press that button and what happens on screen, it's more of a direct relationship when you're running at 60 or at least a lock 30 because there's just an even ratio between the frames you're watching and the, the latency of the button you're pressing. Again, I'm not putting it in scientific terms, that's just how it works. So. Fighting games is definitely one of those games, and you see it, Street Fighter 4 runs at 60, Mortal Kombat 9 and 10 run at 60, Injustice runs at 60, they run at that for a reason, and if you mess with that, you're gonna have a crappy fighting game. Let's also talk about some other genres. Let's talk about um, first person shooters. I mentioned Destiny. I believe Destiny would be much more competitive right now and it would be much more relevant because it definitely has slipped if it were running at 60. Who cares about 1080p? Resolution isn't as big of a deal as frame rate when it comes to gameplay experience, and it shows in Destiny. Now, not as much in the campaign because the campaign's a little slower paced, there's longer gun battles, you're gonna spend a lot more time shooting an enemy and doing a dance, so really having 60 frames isn't a big deal. Where it is a big deal is in the Crucible, where I find having spent so much time playing Call of Duty in the seventh generation at 60 frames, to go back to 30 is terrible. It sucks. I may sound like a whiner and, I, and I'm, my, my hats are off to those crucible experts who can make it work at 30 frames. I salute you people. That's incredible. But for me, when I find, I, I spent a ton of time with Destiny over September, October, I, I eventually got used to it and got better at the Crucible, but then Call of Duty Advanced Warfare came out and I was reminded again of why fast-paced, competitive multiplayer shooters need to run at 60 because now, lining up your shots, so much easier, so much more accurate, the latency so much lower, like between your button press and what happens on screen, and especially when you're panning around, that smoothness, just it just makes it easier to, to, to hit your enemy in, in, in like the heat of the moment. It just, it's just more accurate, you have to understand. I mean, I can't highlight the difference any more than, than when I played Battlefield 3 on the PS3 back in the day, and it was horrible, even because I was used to Call of Duty. Like the, the, the 30 frames a second or substandard 30 frames, as it seemed, was just really jarring, especially when you had to get into quick, quick panning action, it just didn't work. But then what a breath of fresh air when I played Battlefield 4 on the PS4 at 60 frames. It was an absolute game changer and people need to understand why this is mandatory and why Destiny, in my, my opinion, is in trouble. Because yes, they have an expansion coming out, they've tweaked the game, but still, I see people that I know that are trading the game away for other stuff that came out during Gamergeddon, November 18th that week. They, they, I think it was more the fact that Destiny really had no competition when it came out in September. There was nothing else to play at that time. There was a drought, and I think now that even then people knew about its limitations. I'm not saying it's a terrible game, but it's definitely not what we thought it was going to be. And I think those limitations are showing now that people have access to Far Cry 4, which is also 30 frames, but looks so much damn better and is so deeper. And then you've got the, the behemoth of Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, which surprised everybody this year. Um, with its incredible gameplay mechanics running at 60, it's really hard for me to go back to Crucible at this point. So, wow, this has already gone about uh, nine and a half minutes. Let's keep going. I'm gonna add another five minutes onto this because I really wanna talk about a few more things. Again, I apologize for this episode going a bit longer, but uh, you know that's just the way it goes. It's an hour-ish. Anyway, other genres, speedrunning platformers. Definitely, 60 frames has, has really, increase the fun factor of games like Rayman Legends, New Super Mario Brothers U, Super Meat Boy, where because they're speedrun oriented, it just makes it so much more competitive in terms of how you can achieve that high score when you have that many more frames to work with in terms of, again, quick, 
twitchy pinpoint movements that especially I've played a lot of Rayman Legends speedruns and if I played at anything lower than 60 I wouldn't be able to do that pinpoint precision so it really helps those type of games also third person action let's look at The Last of Us remaster for PS4 Massive difference between the PS3 and the PS4. Not only uh, versions, not only on a graphical level. Let's forget about the 1080p, which which looks fantastic. I will admit, it's the frame rate. And while it doesn't really enhance the story campaign that much, which is meant to be cinematic at a more 30 locked uh, uh, state of affairs, and frame rate. What am I talking about? Anyway, the increase to 60 frames on on the multiplayer mode is a game changer okay i found the multiplayer mode on the ps3 okay like it was a decent 30 frames a second kind of reminded me of a slower paced kind of grand theft auto game but now it's 60 especially with a stealth game like that where where every shot counts and you have limited ammo having it at 60 frames makes long range aiming which you're going to do a lot of in that factions mode it just makes it easier so yes a game changer in terms of making it more fun Finally, another genre that needs, that I think increasingly needs to be at 60 because of pinpoint precision is the driving genre. Is there any reason why Gran Turismo is usually heralded as one of the ultimate great racing franchises? Because of the 60 frames. That was a game changer seeing that on, on like the PS3 and I think even PS2 era could handle it, but definitely the PS3 GTA 5, Gran Turismo 5 was just something to behold and it just made the, it, it really, made Gran Turismo easier in the seventh generation for me. I had struggled with that game in previous generations at, at the 30 frames a second, but bringing it up to 60 made it easier to play. It just made it more accurate, more responsive, and I found myself getting better lap times on the PS3 version. So that's why I'm looking forward to it on PS4. Whereas a lot of current racing games, barring Project Cars, which comes out next year, which is supposed to be 60 frames, the Crew is running at 30, Drive Club's running at 30, Need for Speed's running at 30, Forts is running at 30, and as long as they can get it at a locked 30 frames, they can get away with it. But now, let's talk about 30 frames in reality, because we've heard a lot of kind of uh, misinformation about, about its necessity and importance in the industry. Now, I'm not saying that 30 frames isn't needed. It's, I'm gonna get into why it's needed. We still need 30 frames in certain situations, but overall, when I hear the defenses for 30 frames a second in most like action adventure games or driving games, they all seem to be excuses. They all seem to be excuses for limitations in current hardware. And, and, you, and it's most notable in the interview with who was it? Uh, Paul Roshinsky of Drive Club speaking with Eurogamer. He, he valued the obsessive visual detail at a locked frame rate, which is why they went with a lock 30, because it was crucial that every control input mode would be consistent among all players, and there was a greater chance of disparity at a variable frame rate. So that essentially means that the PS4 couldn't handle their ambitions. That limited native hardware couldn't handle it, and I don't think they understood enough about how to harness the power of the cloud yet to put it over the edge, right? And to get that, not only that network working properly, but to get it up to the 60 frames that it needs to be to look, to be a truly gorgeous looking racing game. I'm not saying all racing games need to be at 60. Some might be a little more cinematic and they can stick at 30 because definitely I will agree that 30 frames definitely does lend a more cinematic air to certain games. Like for instance, going back to the last of us for ps4 again you can lock it in at 30 frames and i would argue that when you do that it definitely has that strobey movie effect for the cutscenes, and then it also has deeper harder shadows because of the more black that's being inserted by the millisecond in between your frames because you're running at a lower frame rate there's more black space in between each frame that darkens the image also it's arguable that something like beyond two souls heavy rain Alan Wake wouldn't look cinematic anymore at 60 frames. It needs to look Hollywood-like, and even film, true cinematic movies don't run at 30, they run at 24, but in video game terms, 30 frames is 24 to video games. So by keeping it at that, you keep games like that cinematic. So I wouldn't totally rule it out, but when, uh, when Ubisoft, like who was it from Ubisoft? It was um, not only Nicholas Guerin, but uh, the, the creative director Alex Amancio that saying 30 frames was our goal. It feels more cinematic. 60 is really good for a shooter action adventure, not so much. Again, excuses. Basically, just saying that you know what, you guys got too ambitious with Assassin's Creed Unity. You wanted too much. 
for the current gen hardware and not only did you did you you minimize your potential on the hard, console side but then you force PC gamers to eat the same bullets so that's crap I mean we already saw that action adventure games can widely benefit from 60 frames look at how well much better Tomb Raider Definitive Edition runs on PS4 than its PS3 counterpart or like I said last of us multiplayer on the PS4 versus PS3 so that's just a crap excuse it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't really it, it, he's, he's right about it looking cinematic, but he's putting it in the wrong context. Let's just put it that way. He's he's applying it to something that doesn't necessarily need to be movie-like. And and they also argue that Assassin's Creed looks more real by going at 30 frames a second. I don't know. It, it's just excuses. The point is, you need to give people that choice. If they want 60 frames, they should have it. You know, don't make excuses that, you know, oh... Oh, we didn't want 60 frames anyway. It's it's too fast for our game. No, you gotta give people the choice. You know, we're into a new era. PC gaming is set to possibly take over console gaming at any time if things don't spark with cloud processing to 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 close that hardware that that horsepower gap. And, and I think console makers by use, leveraging the cloud and by by changing their development practice, console developers, I should say, can respond by at least giving that option to players to customize their visual experience so if they may not like the default they can tweak it to their liking same goes with pc i think now that more people are trying to get into budget level pc gaming you developers need to offer that lock 30 option it's still a rarity among pc games there's there's so much to say more to say about this i've went over again but i really want to wrap this up with 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 kind of like the way to go in the future for the frame rate debate number one there are new technologies on the horizon that are going to try to cure the problems with variable frame rates. You've got NVIDIA's G-Sync, which can take a game running at 40 frames and make it look like it's running at 60 frames. That's exciting. You've also got the slow emergence of 120 frame a second gaming, which is going to make competitive, fast-paced first-person shooters even more accurate and intuitive. You've got cloud gaming, which I talked about last week, which can use the power of the internet and multiple servers at any time to increase performance not provided by native hardware like the PS4, Xbox One, but bring them up to a PC gaming level by using the internet. And really just awareness by understanding, by gamers understanding which genres require which type of frame rates. If it's a more movie-like game, definitely keep it at 30. If it's a hardcore, fast-paced, twitchy game, you need 60. All right, so I've run it over time. Mike Frusos for the Joystick Justice League. If you have any more uh, comments about frame rate or you want to debate me a little bit, please, I keep my comment section open. Definitely sound off. Stay tuned for another episode next week where I'm going to be covering at details. Most likely going to be a Sony-related episode of JGL Live Episode 4 where we're going to be, I'm going to be covering in detail the PlayStation Experience event happening in Vegas this weekend because I know there's going to be a lot of crazy reveals. So uh, Mike Frusos for the Joystick Justice League. Thanks for listening. Have a good one, guys, and game on.